Welcome back again to Miss Core's Reading Corner. Today I'm going to read an essay from the anthology, Nevertheless We Persist. And this one is called As Is by Alicia Rayner. And she is an actress who has been in um, Orange is the New Black, as well as How to Get Away with Murder, and a lot of other famous shows. There are also some bad words in this, so I try to um, soften the blow. I never know how to begin something like this, how to start. I hate beginnings. They scare the shit out of me. Here is why. There's a voice in my head that says, you're not cool enough. You're not smart enough. You're not a good enough writer. You are dyslexia. You can't spell. You're not famous enough. Nobody cares about what you have to say. Actually gives a shit. You are worthless. You are stupid. You are too fat, ugly, dumb, old, untalented. And then I persist. The biggest lesson in life I have learned, the deepest lesson I want to teach my daughter, is to persist. To not listen to those voices, to talk back, to tell them to shut up, to move forward, to get back up. So I am writing this for her. Last night I was at a party. People wanted to take their pictures with me. People wanted to take pictures of me. People recognized me. People told me they love me. They love my show. They love my work. They love my acting. They love the film I produced. They love what I do for women. That happens every day. In the same day, an old friend, someone I went to high school with, saw me and told me how beautiful I look. And I swear on my daughter's life, I thought to myself, effin' liar, effin' Hollywood liar. I could feel sad about that. Poor me, poor baby, I was so bullied. I was treated like shit for so long, I just can't believe the good stuff. Or I could use it for fodder. Kindling for the fire in my belly, to fight for the underdog, to fight for justice, equity, and all, to be love, to be compassion. I'm writing this essay for the little girl who still believes she sucks, for all girls who question their worth, for all people who question their worth, and for my daughter. I was so young when I started getting teased. We call it bullying now, but back then it was just teasing. I remember rumors that I weighed 200 pounds before I was even nine. I remember never wearing the right thing, never being in the right crowd always being picked last for every team, never being invited to anything. Back then, there were no rules about inviting all the kids in your class. You could leave out the two losers, and I was always one of them. I was too fat, too tall, too shy. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin, it hurt. At home, my parents fought constantly and worked all the time. I was a latchkey kid, so it felt like my dad was the TV and my mom was a huge place of hostess ho-ho cakes, and I could swear the filling inside a Twinkie tasted like a kiss. I still thank God for the TV shows of my youth and those sweet treats. They kept me from drugs, alcohol, even suicide, which some of my friends chose instead. I was about eight when I went on my first diet. I mean, one I put myself on, instead of the ones everyone else had me on. I can't actually remember a time in my childhood when I wasn't on a diet of one kind or another. I was never allowed bread, pasta, or sweets. The famous story of my childhood was when my mom left me with my grandparents for some months as an infant, and when she got back, the first thing she said was, she's so fat. I want to defend that child, that baby, that innocent child who wasn't accepted, who learned way too early that she wasn't okay as is. I want to hold that baby in my arms and hug her and love her and tell her I love her no matter what, and she is so beautiful no matter what. I am still healing that baby girl. After years of trying and failing at, all the diets everyone else put me on, in my teens, I got creative and made it my own. The one apple a day diet. The diet coke and trident diet. The soup diet. The chew and spit it out diet. The one bite of everything and then put dish soap on it diet. I was maybe most proud of inventing the condiments diet. You could have unlimited condiments, just nothing to put them on. I do remember feeling like I wasn't supposed to be doing this. I remember feeling like it was all supposed to be a secret and I have no idea why. Did I want people to think I just magically lost all this weight? I started trying diet pills I ordered from the back of Cosmo. Laxatives, exercising in the middle of the night. My life got so small. It was all about the rules of the latest diet and numbers. Number of calories, number of days without sugar, sizes. If only I was thinner, I would be invited. I would have a boyfriend. I would get good grades. If only I got thin, my life would be perfect. Perfect. The voice is up again. This is so boring. Everyone knows this story. Everyone has this story. Everyone felt like this. This is so stupid. I'm so boring. I'm such a bad writer. Why do I think I am? Or who do I think I am? I was tall from a very early age. Never gangly because I was never thin. And around 9 or 10, I grew my nose. Just like my first diet, I can't remember exactly when it changed, 
what the moment was when I suddenly had a nose that was not cute as a button variety babies are born with? I don't remember noticing it myself. I was just trying to navigate being a kid, going from pretending and Barbies to homework and mean girls, but suddenly strangers were telling me about my nose. Distant aunts and uncles asking, started asking if I was going to have it fixed, or actually, when are you going to have it fixed? So many people not asking me how I felt about my face, but telling me there's something wrong with your face. I had doctors offer to do it for free. That still blows my mind. I felt like the elephant girl. I wanted to hide for the rest of my life. And yet, I wasn't sure I wanted it fixed. I was willing to starve myself to change my body, do anything to try to make myself thin, but I felt strongly that if the universe had given me this nose, this was the nose I was meant to go through life with. And as I started getting attention from men, grown men, if they thought I was pretty, then maybe I was, even if the boys my age acted if I was invisible. I was in high school now, and all the girls around me had boobs. Excuse me. Forgot that I'm a grown-up here for a second. Breasts. I was flat as a pancake, maybe throw in a couple of chocolate chips here and there, but no melons, apples, or grapefruits. I did all those silly chest exercises to try to make them grow. I would pray to God or whomever to make them grow. So here I was, the chubby girl with a big nose, no boobs, and a huge supply of diet pills, laxatives, and self-hate. And the only kid in my class with parents who were divorcing, as if I needed another reason to hate myself. It's hard for me to recall all this, to write it down, in part because I've worked quite hard to let it go. One of my favorite acting teachers of all time, Ian Tucker, once told a class I was in that as actors, we have to be brilliant shedders. We have to shed the last audition, the fight with our lover, the subway being late, the insult about our nose, the cruel comments about our lack of thigh gap. Otherwise, we walk into a room to audition with huge heavy bags, like dragging in 500 pound duffel bags full of self-hate, self-doubt, and crappy history, and asking the casting director or producer or director to hold our bags while we audition. No one wants to hold our baggage. It's really freaking heavy. So I learned to let go. How? How did I learn to let go and get back up? How did I learn to believe in myself? I won't bore you with all the details, but the eating disorder got really bad. I was probably clinically depressed, and my dad's second wife caught me stealing laxatives out of the bathroom and told me about OA, the 12-step program that teaches you how to get out of an addiction to overeating. I never talked in the media about being in the program. I'm pretending as I write that this will stay private. You guys won't tell, right? But I think it's important. How did I get to this moment, free of plastic surgery with only a small sachet of self-doubt? I found acting. I found a place where I could get out of my own body and be anyone or anything. I found an incredible acting teacher in high school, Peter Royal, who taught me how to serve art and led me on a lifelong journey of getting out of my own way. I found literature and lots of characters and books who felt like I did. I think it started with the story of Ferdinand and led to Judy Bloom. Karen in It's Not the End of the World was my BFF. Blubber was my homegirl. Suddenly I didn't feel so alone. I kept finding amazing books that gave me a little hope. I never really was into video games, but I had friends who were. And sometimes I felt like I was living in a game of old school Super Mario Brothers. I kept finding gold coins on the road that sustained me. The self-help section of my local bookstore saved my life. My tools were The Artist's Way, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, Wayne Dyer, Oprah, Deepak Chopra, and when I met my husband David, just out of my teens, he was reading The Road Less Traveled. I thought he was just pretending to read it to pick up chicks, but he was actually reading it, and we bonded over the desire to grow ourselves. It's funny to us that woke is an expression now, because back when I met him doing Shakespeare in Vermont, my first professional job, we started talking about people who want to sleep through life and people who want to be awake. And the thing that I think has kept us together all these years is that we want to stay awake. We promised to wake each other up if either of us fell asleep at the wheel of life. And I found my people. I found David. But even before I found him, I went to camp or after school programs or, of course, theater at school. And I found the losers and the outliers like me. People who cared what I thought or loved what I, that I was a great listener or that I could make laugh or would, could, would act with me, play with me. My games of pretend from my childhood saved me in the end. So what have I learned? What do I want to tell you? What are the secrets of the universe I wish someone had told me? You get to a certain age and you feel like you have heard it all and you have no wisdom to share, but the cliches are all true. Yes, you are the only entry in the insert your name section of the dictionary. Yes, persist. Yes, it will get better. Yes, get back up. Yes, shed your baggage. Yes, think of your life as a video game and look for the treasures. Yes, find your toolkit. And yes, love yourself as is.
So this is Miss Cora again, and I just wanted to say what stuck with you. I really, really, really enjoyed reading this, and there's so many things that I just connected with over and over again. But like she said, she really found amazing books that gave her hope. And I really, I, I just, so that, I, I so agree with that. And the books that she mentions happen to be when I was like in a period of uh, self-examination for like after my second divorce. Um, I read these books. I read the same exact book she did, The Artist's Way, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, I, Deepak Chopra, all like any book that could like uh, was a self-improvement book I, I read it I read audiobooks um, I read The Road Less Traveled I read poetry and that's just something that really stuck with me from this is you don't have to be who who you who everybody tells you that you are you can you can shed all that and become the person that you want to be